You're good. 
singing with us. We're just getting started today. You can go ahead and have a seat. And as you do that, something we love doing here at City First is celebrating life change. Let's check out Anita's story together. With a little accent mark over the E. Oh, okay. Anita. Anita. Really, before I was married, before, I was kind of a different human, okay? I was still the life of the party and so nice and I had I have so many friends and had so many friends um, but I was still very lost so I was a mommy I was a young mommy um, I have three sons but at this time I had only had one Jaden and his dad and I um, we had decided that we were gonna take a little break we got together very young so when Jaden would be with daddy I didn't know who I was I had no idea and although I was like nice and caring and all of these things, I had zero sense of self-worth. Who the heck was I? I now am alone with my thoughts. And I don't think I like who I am. And one day, I will never forget it, um, I was probably like the lowest I had ever been. Jaden was with his daddy and I was just in his room 
I was just, couldn't wait for him to come home so that I could feel like, oh, there you go. You're worth something, you know? But I just fell to my knees for the first time in my life and I just said, I give it all to you. I just said, all of it, every bit of it, every single bit of it in my life, I don't want control over it anymore. I don't like how I feel. I just want you to take control of my life, God. I give every bit of it over to you. I had already felt that desire to get baptized and all that without even stepping foot in the building. And that very first time that I walked out that parking lot and I opened those doors to come back in person at City First Church after watching that whole time online was the day that I decided to get baptized. And I will never forget getting ready to go in that water. I prayed the whole entire way walking up. And when I got in that water and he started praying with me, I just looked up at the lights and I just said, I love you, Jesus. I'm doing this for you, Jesus. Like I just, it was just, I, I didn't want to think about one single thing but him when I did that. It wasn't like a, oh, I'm saved, you know, this is crazy. It was like, that was something that I chose to do. And from this moment on, I will never be the same. And I did not, I didn't really understand that impact on what having a church and life group and coming to these conferences and being a part of these, just this community, how it's changed my life, you know? I just, I just can't believe it, so. Just keeps getting better and better and better with every single experience that I've had with City First. And it was because I just made that one decision. That was it. Amen. Amen. You can give Jesus one more huge hand clap about that. It's all about him. If you kind of were to encapsulate what City First Church is all about, it's about stories like that. Jesus changing people, making a difference in people's lives. And we are so excited that next week is actually a baptism Sunday. How some, what, some of our favorite Sundays around this place. And if you are maybe somebody who has recently given your life to Jesus and you've decided to follow him, you've made him the leader and the forgiver of your life, or maybe you've been following Jesus for a little while and you've just never taken that next step to be water baptized, really what that is, water baptism, is just simply saying that inward decision, I'm making an outward declaration that Jesus has changed my life and I've decided to follow him and I'm never turning back. And so we would love to have you make that decision and kind of follow Jesus in that whole um, next step of of being water baptized. And to sign up for that, you can do that through our app or through our website, or if you're in the room, you can stop by one of our next step booths on the way. But I'll tell you what, and this is what I know, okay? Because guess what? I'm human just like you. Is that I know that that can be a big next step. And you're like, seriously, Jen, I don't know. That might be something Anita could do, but not me. No, no, no. If the Holy Spirit, if Jesus is whispering you, to you that that's the next step, just take it. We'll hand walk you through the whole thing. We'll be here for you. It was the best decision next to following Jesus that you'll ever make. And we'll be right along with you as your church family. So can we, just an early encouragement to those who are going to take that step. Can we give them a huge hand clap? You got this. You got this. Super excited. Well, you know, stories like Anita's and what we're about ready to see next week are the reason why each and every time that we gather together as a church, we give people an opportunity to give back to God. And so to participate in the giving today, there's going to be instructions on the screen. You can give through the City First Church app. You can give through website. If you're in the room and you have a physical gift that you'd like to give, a cash or check, you can, there's offering boxes at the back. And you can drop that off after service is dismissed. And uh, just a little highlight, okay, if you are a generosity rock star in this place, can we give it up for our generosity rock stars? 
Those are the incredible people who give $20 a week or more through recurring giving, which means you've set that up. You know, if you are a generosity rock star, we've contacted you and we've let you know that we have a new giving platform called PushPay. And if you could do us a huge favor and help make that jump, that would be a huge help to us. And if you have questions about that or if you need help, you can stop by the main Next Step booth on, in, in the lobby or you can give the church offices a call and we'd love to walk you through that. But as you take a few moments maybe to prepare your gift, I want you to do this. You can actually do this and stand up at the same time. So I want you to stand up. You can give and stand up at the same time, right? We are going to continue in our time of worship today, which is basically where here around here we, we sing some songs to God. And even, here's the deal, no matter what your singing voice is, God wants to hear from you. The music and the people around you are loud enough that, guess what, nobody's listening to you. <laughs> But God wants to hear your voice today. And we're going to sing a song called Same God. And really this song talks about how the same God of the scriptures is the same God that we sing to today. The same God that helped David defeat Goliath is the same God we pray to. And the same God that parted the Red Sea for Moses so that the children of Israel could walk through to freedom. Guess what? That's the same God we pray to. It's the same God we worship in these next few moments. So I don't know what you are carrying, but in these next few moments, what we're going to do is we're going to declare that that same God is over our situations. He's over the need that you have. He's over that family struggle. He's over that thing that you're carrying that seems too heavy for you. And so in these next few moments, let's sing together and declare who God is. Love you, church. You can do all things, Jesus. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opens up. I need you now to do the same thing for me. I need you, Jesus. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How oh, I need you now. Oh, children and 
Church, can we give them praise? Thank you for your faithfulness, Father. Lord, we're so grateful today that we know you hear us as we pray. And the lyrics that we're singing, God, it's who you are. It's your character, bedrock truth that we can stand upon. You are good. You are faithful. You are strong. You have not changed. You still hear us when we pray. You are still providing. You are still healing. You are still moving. And God, we declare that so that we can remember who you are. We love you in this place today. And everybody said amen. Come on, give him a hand clap. Use your voice. Thank him for who he is. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. Well, again, we're so glad you're with us. You can go ahead, have a seat. As you do that, tell the person next to you, you're looking great today. We have some exciting things happening around here at City First, so you can hear more about all that's planned. Let's check this out together. is one church with multiple locations. Hello to everyone joining us online from all around the world and to everyone in a seat at our Spring Creek and Cape Coral locations. And a huge welcome to all of the guys at God Behind Bars. And now let's take a second and check out everything happening around here at City First. 21 days of prayer and fasting is happening right now through January 28th. If you're at a physical location, pick up a prayer booklet and a wristband as you exit. Or for an electronic copy, visit our website or the City First app. Also, join us for Saturday morning guided prayer and worship 
in the main auditorium from 8.30 to 9.15 a.m. Next week is Baptism Sunday. If you recently made the decision to make Jesus the leader and forgiver of your life and want to take the next step in this journey, simply visit cityfirst.church forward slash baptism. First Wednesday is February 1st. Each and every time we gather, we spend intentional time in worship, prayer, and communion. Invite someone to join you online or in person. Our new semester of life groups begins February 5th. Life groups have one simple purpose, to bring people together and to grow in community. And we have a life group for everyone. Visit our website or app to host Host or join a group. Men's event is February 24th. Men, mark your calendars for this one night only event featuring special guest Choco de Jesus. It'll be a mile marker event packed with games, giveaways, good food, and growing together. Register today for the best price possible. Visit the City First app and follow us on social media to stay updated on all things City First. Finally, if you have a small child in service, please utilize our family room or mother's room designed for you to enjoy service with your child. Thanks so much for joining us today. And now we continue our series, It's Time with the message from Pastor Jeremy DeWert. Hello, City First Church family. Give it up for everyone joining us right now. Cape Coral, God Behind Bars, City First Anywhere, and obviously right here at our Spring Creek location. I'm just very glad that you're here today. Um, you know, before I begin, I just want to call us to prayer today. And here's the reason why. I don't know if you saw the forecast, but throughout the Midwest, there's supposed to be a lot of tornadoes and such, such like that. In fact, um, at Lambeau Field and also at Soldier Field, they designated these as official shelters because I guess touchdowns don't happen in late January a lot at these places. So... Uh, <laughs> Are we in a sad conference or what? I mean, come on. My goodness. Anyway, all right. Well, listen, uh, <laughs> we are in a series called It's Time, It's Time, It's Time. It's time the Bears start winning. I don't know. But anyway, um, it is a new year. It is a new year, ladies and gentlemen. And in January, we believe this is a perfect time to start focusing on the you that you want to be, more importantly, the you that God wants you to be. And so we have this series called It's Time, and today I want to talk about it's time to come home. It's time to come home. And if you're listening here today, I want to say a little disclaimer off the beginning of this message. If you are thinking to yourself silently, I'm not sure I belong here. Whether you're in person or watching us online right now, you're like, I'm not sure if I belong here. I'm not really the religious type. Uh, maybe 2022 was a less than stellar moment for you spiritually. Or you're like asking yourself, do I fit at City First? And more importantly, do I fit in a relationship with God? I want to say, this is the perfect day for you because my message is going to directly relate to where you're at. In fact, I love it when people come here or watch and they're not real sure if they fit. That means you're in the right place here at City First because Jesus tended to draw two types of people, two categories of people, you could say. As you read the, the Gospels in the New Testament, the first category is he would always draw to him people that were sinners, people that were broken, people that were marginalized and on the fringes, you could say. These are the people that followed him. Second group of people are the Pharisees or the religious leaders of the day. These are the people that thought they had it all together. These are the two people that constantly followed Jesus. The first group followed Jesus because they needed help and they were desperate and they wanted solutions to life. The second group followed Jesus because they wanted to find fault in his teachings. They wanted to trap him. Imagine being Jesus. You're every day walking through highways and byways, towns, cities, and villages, stopping along the way to talk to people, to have dinner with people, to heal people. And the whole time, there's this other group of people that are following you, the Pharisees, and these are the true haters. They are trying to trap you. They're trying to find flaw in your teaching, and they're trying to get you in some theological trap. This is Jesus' life. And the more that he talked, and the more that he taught, the more that the first category of people, the first group, the sinners, the marginalized, the broken, they followed him. And then the more that it really ticked off the second group. In fact, we find out in the book of Luke, chapter 15, it says tax collectors and other notorious sinners. I don't know why tax collectors are kind of like in their category of their own. But evidently it's like tax collectors, the IRS, as well as notorious sinners. 
often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees, that second group of people, and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. Now, the word associating there is important. He wasn't doing what they were doing, but he was talking to them. He was eating like dinner with them. He was healing them. He was touching them. And I will tell you, this made the Pharisees very uncomfortable. And it even said this, even eating with them. Now, we don't understand this in today's context, but I want to take you back 2,000 years into the Middle East, into the context where Jesus was. If you ate with someone who was a quote-unquote sinner, that meant that not only did you accept them, but you affirmed their lifestyle. That's what it meant. So the Pharisees would never eat with a tax collector. The Pharisees would never eat with a prostitute, would never eat with someone who's an adulterer. Why? Because to them it meant by eating with them and sharing a table that they actually approved of their lifestyle. That's what they thought. In fact, they even taught this. They said, if you eat with a sinner, you yourself will become, in their words, unclean. In other words, you become dirty because you're eating with dirty people. That was their thought. And here comes Jesus. He's a different type of rabbi. And Jesus eats with the dirty people. Jesus talks to those that are unclean. Jesus defends the woman that was caught in adultery. Jesus defends the prostitute. All of a sudden, it turns everything upside down, and these Pharisees are all wound up about it. And we get the impression that Jesus hung out with the unclean people like you and I very often. And this is very, very important for you to understand this, because if you understand the context of how Jesus is living 2,000 years ago, you're going to understand this 2,000-year-old story I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to tell you a story that Jesus told, but you got to understand that he is already scandalous in the eyes of the Pharisees because of how he associated with the unclean people. Well, Jesus is God, right? We know this. He's fully man and fully God. And so the Pharisees are all like in a conundrum about this, and he realizes that, he hears them, and he probably knows because he's God, he can read their minds, right? And, and so he knows they're all wound up about this idea that he's hanging around with unclean people. So he tells three stories. And Jesus tells stories. If you want to know the truths of life, listen to Jesus' stories. Because embedded in these stories that we call parables, there are truisms on how we're to live life and who God really is. So this is what Jesus does. He tells a story about a lost sheep. He tells a story about a lost coin. And then lastly, he tells a story about a lost son. And this last story is the one that I want to focus on today. It's one of my favorite stories that Jesus tells. It's the story of the prodigal son. But listen, there are many characters in this story. It's not just the prodigal son. And today we're going to break down this story. And hopefully we'll understand a little bit more about God and a little bit more about us. And so it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 31, it's a long passage of Scripture. So I'm going to read it all because I want you to hear it all. So stay with me. If you don't have a Bible, you can read it on the screens or on the lower third, uh, you know, uh, online. Or if you don't have a Bible, if you're at a physical location, on the way out the door, stop at a Next Step booth. We'll give you a free Bible, all right? I believe that everybody should have a Bible. And so it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, to illustrate the, fir the point further, in other words, to drive home the point that Jesus was all about the marginalized and the unclean. He told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Remember this. He's basically asking for the estate, for the bequest, for the trust. He's wanting it now before the dad dies. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between the sons. A few days later... This young son picked up all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. This is the son of a person who owned an estate who's now in the pig sty feeding the pigs. 
The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants, in other words, the ranchers, have enough food to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So in other words, he's not even wanting to slip back in into the status of a son. He's like, make me a rancher. Make me a servant. Make me just a part of the home again. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. And before he can even get the words out of like, make me a servant, make me a rancher, says this, the father said to his servants, quick, bring, or bring the finest robe in the home in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead, but now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. The party began. Goes on to say, meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother is back, he was told. Your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. <laughs> now listen, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, begged the older son but he replied, all these years, I've slaved for you, Dad, and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat, let alone a calf, for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours, not my brother, not when my brother comes home, but this son of yours comes back after squandering your money, on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother, reminds him, this is not my son, this is your brother, was dead and has come back to life, has been lost, but now he is Found. What an amazingly complicated story. This is the story of the prodigal son. We call it the prodigal son. Jesus never called it the prodigal son. I would correct that title. We call it the prodigal son. I would say it's the story of the prodigal sons, plural. Both of them are lost. Both of them have wrong hearts. And actually in the story, there are three main characters. There is the son who runs. There is the son who who stays, and the father who waits. All three are in the story. Let's look at these characters today. First of all, the son who runs. Now, in this day, again, I'm going to time warp you back 2,000 years into the context of that culture. It would have been highly, highly offensive for a son to come to a living father and to ask for his inheritance early. Why? Because basically what the son was doing, the son was saying to the dad, Dad, I wish you were dead. I just want your money. That's really what he's saying. He's going, Dad, I want your possessions and your money and the estate now. I know you're still alive. I want out of this relationship. I consider you dead. Now, in a Middle Eastern family in Jesus' day, if a son came and made this request, what would most likely happen is the dad would backhand the son, beat him, and send him out of the family and disown him. That's what would happen because it was a patriarchal society. Dad was in charge. The father was a small G God. And so 
for a son to disrespect the father by basically saying, I want you dead and I want your money, at that moment there would have been a severing and that son would have been kicked out of the estate and out of the home. But instead, Jesus tells about a different father. And I guarantee you, if you were listening in that day in the crowd, whether you were a broken person or a Pharisee, you would have thought what he said was absolutely ludicrous. Jesus says the dad agrees to it. He says, okay, son, I'm going to divide the estate in half, 50-50, and I'm going to give you 50% of it, and the other 50% of it is going back in the bank for your older brother someday. And so what does the younger son do? The younger son takes 50% of the estate, all the money, and he leaves and goes to another country, and he begins to have wine and women and buy fast donkeys, and he is living it up. He's like making it rain, right? And basically this son is saying, hey, listen, I know the rules of my dad's house. I know the benefits of my father's house. I know that it is safe there. It's secure there. I have everything I want, but I don't want any of those things. I'm going my own way. And I will tell you that in the younger son's heart, we can resonate and find that sometimes in our hearts regardless of whether we're the oldest child, youngest child, or middle child, we can find ourselves looking at the Heavenly Father and saying, I just want to do things my own way. Maybe some of you today, you've grown up in church. Maybe you grew up in church, and today it's the first time back for a really long time. In fact, if your mama or your daddy knew you were here, they'd be like, whoa, what? But you came back to church today, whether online or in person. You grew up in a family that preached the Bible you would even say, stuffed it down your throat. And you've seen hypocrites in the church or an organized religion, and you think it's rather pious that these religious people should apply and try to make the standards that they live by and believe in apply to you. And so you're like, don't put your standards, your rules, your religiosity on me. I don't need church. I don't need God. I don't need your religion. You religious folk, you just do your holy huddle on Sundays. I'm going to live my own life. Maybe you're in that category today. Or maybe you're in another category of where you're not like, you know, rebellious against God. But you know what? You haven't really ran from him, but there is distance between you and God. If you're to really be honest, regardless of your upbringing, whether you grew up in church or not, there's just a distance between you and God. The only time you get a hold of God is if there's a 911 you know, there's something going on, and you're like, okay, God, we haven't talked for a little while, but you know what, could you, could you maybe help me out, do me a favor here? And But you've been pretty much living your own life. You've been doing your own business, doing your own family, doing your own relationships, doing your own educational training or career. So like the younger son, it isn't that necessarily, you know, that maybe you're off in the pigsty, but there is distance between you and the father. Maybe you're in a third category. Maybe you do have a relationship with God, but you look back at maybe the last, uh, I don't know, month, two months, last year, there's been a slow drifting. There's been a, a paralysis that has come into your relationship with God. It isn't that you rejected him. It isn't that you don't like him or church or anything like that. But if you were to really be honest with you, there's just been, there's been distance. All three of those categories we can find ourselves in at some point or another All three of them are distant from the Father. And Jesus said that the son had a wake-up call. All of a sudden, he ran out of money. And it says this in the book of Luke, chapter 15, going back to 14. It says that he ran out of money, and then a great famine came. It was like a double whammy. It was a perfect storm. It was like he ran out of money, and the famine came, and he began to starve. I can guarantee you this. There will be a time in life, and... It may come when you're young or middle-aged or older, but there will be a time in life where you will come to the end of your own resource and there will also be something that's bigger than what you can fix that will happen in your life and it will be a wake-up call. We've all had them or we will have them. Why we live in a hopelessly broken world. 
There's sin, there's garbage. And whenever we try to run our own lives, there will always be things that happen that are out of our control, that your checkbook cannot fix, that your abilities cannot fix, that your, you know, suave and moxie and your, uh, you know, the, the, the talent you have to wiggle your way in and out of situations, you will not have the capacity to get out of this famine. The famine is something that you can't control. Yes, you know what? There is a lack of resource in the young brother's life. He's ran out of money, but guess what? You can always make more money. Famines have to be endured. So some things you can fix in life, and some things, th things you just can't. And he got himself into a situation he couldn't get himself out of. For you, it might be that, you know what? You, you, you have money, but... Uh, then the diagnosis came, and no amount of money is able to fix the problem. Or maybe you have a solid career, but then came the recession and the downsizing and the notice from the corporate headquarters. It was out of your control. Or maybe you have found that significant other, but you didn't realize that now years later you found out that they're cheating. It's out of your control. It's a famine that has to be endured. And no amount of money, and no amount of talent, and no amount of connections can get you out of it. We'll all have these moments, and it may not be one that I've mentioned, but it will be a famine. And I'll tell you what it's going to make you do. It's going to make you hungry for something real. The famine is going to create an emptiness inside, and that famine is going to drive us to figure out a solution for that inner hunger. You know what happens to the youngest son is in verse 17, he finally came to his senses, right? Finally came to his senses, and he goes, man, even the hired ranch hands, they have more than I have. The people that work for my dad have more than I have, and so I need to go back, and I'm not going to try to slip back in at a son level. I'm going to try to slip back in at a servant level. I just want to get in the house again. And then it goes on to say this, it goes on to say, so he returned, and then something just crazy happens. If you are listening to Jesus' story 2,000 years ago, this moment makes you scratch your head. Jesus says, while the son was still a long ways off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Okay, listen, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, Fathers don't run. Fathers that own great estates rule. They don't run. This is a patriarchal society. Fathers are dignified. They snap their fingers and the entire family does whatever they want. They point in a direction and servants go running. See, women run in the Middle Eastern days that Jesus was in 2,000 years ago. Women run, kids run, young adults run, fathers don't run. Fathers are dignified. Fathers are scary. Fathers command a presence. And yet Jesus talks about a different type of father. He talks about a father who's in control. Yes, he's in charge, but who is willing to run to a son who's wayward, that's making his way back. And at this point, if you're listening to Jesus, it doesn't make sense because your whole life you've grown up in homes where fathers don't run. But Jesus says there's a different type of father. There's a father that reaches out, a father who embraces, a father who forgives, a father who sees the sun on the horizon a long ways off and gets off of his porch and runs out to the sun. You see, what Jesus is trying to show us is this is a symbol of a heavenly father's unconditional acceptance and love. He loves us. He accepts us. Oh, he doesn't approve of the way that we've been living, but he accepts us because we're a son and a daughter. Jesus was saying, this is a picture, by the way, we're peeking in the windows of heaven here. This is a picture of what the heavenly father is like, a God who runs. This is, I'm telling you, this is something that separates the Christian faith from every other faith. There is not another faith that has a God that's willing to be undignified and run out to his creation. 
for relationship. There is not one. The gods of the Romans, the gods of the Greeks, you know, the Stoics, all these people, they served gods that they feared, that they thought would strike them with lightning or sickness if they screwed up one iota. And Jesus says, no, the real God is the God who's willing to send his son to die on a cross for our sin, a God who reaches our direction, who runs to us. See, this story is really about uh, two sons, though, two lost sons. We talked about the one that ran. Well, how about the one that stayed? Both of them are blind. Both of them are wrong in their hearts. So the youngest son comes home. The oldest son is out in the field. Father runs out to the youngest son. Father grabs a fine robe. Robe was a sign of royalty back in that day. And so basically he's saying, my, my son that squandered 50% of my estate on prostitutes and wine and fast donkeys. I'm now going to clothe him in royalty. And then he said, and we're going to slaughter a cow. You didn't slaughter cows back then. I mean, like, unless it was a pretty important feast or something that was very important, like a wedding, you didn't do that. You ate lamb. You didn't eat, you didn't eat like, like beef and because it was very expensive. And so he said, we're going to go ahead and we are going to slaughter the most expensive meal that we possibly can. And we're going to have a party. But the oldest son wants nothing, nothing with it, wants nothing, has nothing uh, to give towards it or wants to be a part of it. And here's a few reasons why. The oldest son has basically three arguments right here. First of all, he's been faithful. He's been faithful. He's been out in the fields. He's been helping to run the estate. Guess what? The younger son takes off, which means the older son has to take on his work. He's been working harder. And, and now he doesn't feel celebrated. Remember what he says to the father? He says, after all I've done for you, how I've slaved for you. See, he's looking at the father and he's like, I've been faithful in the house. And yet you keep looking to the horizon, looking for the son that went off to squander 50% of your estate, who disrespected you. And I've been here picking up his slack, and I've been here doing the work, and I've been faithful. And you haven't even given me a young goat, let alone slaughter the fatted calf. And guess what? It's easy to do that, to have that older brother mentality even in church. Because it's easy. Here's one thing I've discovered. I've followed Jesus for over 30 years of my life. The older we get in God, the easier it is to think it's more about me. We can become selfish. We can become, um, in, in some ways, entitled. We can say, I've put in my time. I've given my tithes. I've, I've done all these things, and yet... And yet this church is always trying to reach those that are far from faith. Why don't they take care of us that are in the house? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go find another church where I will be celebrated and I will be noticed. And in fact, I will find another church that, that honestly does church in my image. And I will, I will find another church that's more about me than them. And it will be us seven all the way to heaven. And we're going to have really deep Bible studies. And we're going to go really deep into the Greek and the Hebrew. And yeah, our church won't grow. But guess what? We will be celebrated. <laughs> I know, I'm stepping on some toes today, aren't I? No, I'm actually giving you, I'm giving you a peek in the window of City First here. We love the people that are in the house. We take care of the people that are in the house. We say get involved in life groups. Get involved in, like, women's original nights and, and grow. Like, we have a men's event coming up. Get involved and grow. We say that, but we will always be a church who throws the party for the prodigal sons and daughters. We will never close the doors and decide that we're just going to have a Holy Ghost hoedown and we're going to have rapture drills and we're just going to keep us seven all the way to heaven. No, instead, we are going to say, we will be a party. We will gather together with the Father who wants to throw the party for the people that will come home. And today, people are going to come home. Oh, older brother also had a problem with the younger brother because uh, now the inheritance is smaller. Uh, 
See, if you think about it, 50% of the inheritance went to the younger brother. He squandered it. Now there's only 50% left. Now that the dad has accepted the son, the younger brother, back as a true son, not a servant, guess what happens when the father dies? Now 50% that's left is going to get split again. And so the older brother is going to have less. And I see this in churches all over the place. Those that have been faithful have to share the resources with those that don't deserve it. The ones that came in the door, they've been wayward, they, they've been doing things, and all of a sudden, instead of all of the resources and all the time and all the energy going towards the older brother, now it's shared with the younger brother that doesn't deserve it. And isn't that Jesus, by the way? <laughs> that he was willing to give up heaven to come down to earth, that he was willing to give up riches and glory to become common so that a relationship could be built that the father could walk across someday. So the older brother had a problem with this, and then lastly, the older brother, he just could not wrap his head around how the father could accept a son that had done such despicable things. And isn't that also what we feel like a lot of times in church? It's like we want people to come walking in the doors that are sinners, but certain type of sinners. <laughs> maybe ones that are a little, sin that's a little bit more palatable than maybe those other sins that are in the category over here. And we're like, oh yeah, Jesus can forgive these sins, but man, these? I don't know if we want those type of people at our church. And city first, I'm telling you as a church that every type of sinner can walk in the door because we believe that every sin can be forgiven. And this is what I know, that there are times that we're going to be uncomfortable with who walks in the door. And guess what? We're modeling Jesus at that point who became uncomfortable walking to a cross so that hope could be found in forgiveness. See, there's a difference between acceptance and affirmation. And we will always be a church that accepts. That doesn't mean, just like Jesus was saying in this story, that we celebrate everybody and what they've done. Jesus doesn't look at the prostitute and say, yeah, come on, go back to the whorehouse. He doesn't look at the tax collector and say, yeah, come on, keep swindling, lying, and stealing money from the innocent and the poor. He doesn't do that. He doesn't affirm the lifestyle. What he does is he accepts the son or the daughter that is coming home. And then we go on a journey of becoming more like Jesus. And we're all on that journey, by the way. Going back 2,000 years ago, the father would have probably disowned the older brother for the tone that he had. I've slaved for you, this son of yours. What kind of disrespect is in that voice tone? Oh man, I will tell you again, this is a patriarchal society back in the day, and guess what? That dad would have been like, you don't talk to me that way, pack your bags. How dare you? See, really we have two lost sons here, and I would just say this, that all of us find ourselves probably in one of the categories to a certain degree. I found myself in the younger son category and I've sometimes found myself in the older son category. See, one son tries to find happiness through self-discovery and rebellion. The other son tries to find happiness through moral superiority. And all of us can fall into one of those two categories. Both sons resent the father's decisions. Both sons resent the father's authority, and both sons question the father. And then Jesus ends the story by saying that the father makes a plea to the older son and says, will you please come into the party? Come on, let's celebrate that your younger brother isn't dead somewhere in a gutter in another country, but instead your younger, the younger brother is home. Will you join the party? And then he just ends the story. He drops the mic. It's almost as if Jesus at that point looks at the Pharisees. Remember, they're the ones that are questioning the whole reason he told these three stories. 
And he probably looks at the Pharisees at that point and goes, now it's your move. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? See, this is a story of two wayward sons. And sometimes our hearts can fall into one of those two sons. But more importantly, it's the story of a father who runs, who looks at less than perfect people like you and I and says, come into our house, come into the house, come into the kingdom of God. Come on, come on. I forgive you. I invite you. You are accepted. Leave that life and come home. But then he also looks at older brothers and he says this. He goes, listen, come home. The ones who are spiritually policing others, who think that they have a moral superiority. And he says, come into my house, join the party. You also are forgiven. You also are invited. Leave the judgmentalism behind and come into the party. Let's celebrate that people are saved. This is a powerful story because Jesus is basically saying that that this This God, the Father, is so radically different, radically different that he states this. He states that everyone is wrong, everyone is loved by the Father, and everyone must recognize that they need help. That's what he's saying to all of us today. And we forget, whether we're the younger brother or the older brother, we forget that we need forgiveness from the Father. Do you know that, that God... The God who loves you and the God that loves me, the one that created the universe, the one that is so powerful that right now in the throne room of God, there are thousands of angels that are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The God who's not limited by space or time or the opinions of our culture, the God who risked looking undignified by sending himself, his son, to be born in a dirty manger, to walk the con streets of man to be nailed to a cross that God he sat down with sinners like you and I tax collectors prostitutes and he shared communion with 12 inconsiderate men that we now call disciples he said whether we were Jews or Gentiles we did not kill him he willingly walked to that cross to die for each and every one of us and he could have called down 10,000 angels to obliterate and annihilate the men that had the audacity to nail him to a wooden beam. That God, that God says, come home. Come home. Come home. Are you tired of running, younger brother, younger sister? Do you feel a famine on the inside? I want to know. If you come home, you'll be accepted, forgiven, restored, accepted. The robe will be put on you. The party will be thrown. Are you tired of being frustrated, older brother? Are you tired of feeling like the party's happening and you're not getting what you deserved and you're not celebrated? come home. It's time to come home and join the party. Join the party that the Father is throwing because you have been faithful. You've worked hard. You've given. And you can be a part of the celebration too. It's time to come home. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, as I close, if you just say, Today I need to come home. That means different things for different people. But today I need to come home. And I know that maybe I'm a little bit like the younger brother. Maybe I'm a little bit like the older brother. Either way, it's time for me to come home. And if that's you, I just want to pray with you before we dismiss. If you say, I want to come home today. I want my heart to be right. I'm sorry that I've questioned the Father. I'm sorry that I've just had this heart just go ahead and just raise your hand and put it right back down again just anybody yeah hands are up everywhere I guarantee at every location let me pray with you Heavenly Father today we come home as 
younger brothers and older brothers, younger sisters, older sisters. Today, we remind ourselves that we need you. We need you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your unconditional love. Today, we say we're sorry and that we want to be a part of God's great party. As week after week, day after day, more and more people are finding you, we want to be a part of that, a celebration of the Father and His house. We love you in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Thank you Amen. so much, Pastor Jer, for that amazing message. Yeah. So powerful. And if you made that decision to come home, whether it's for the first time or for the millionth time that you feel like you have to come back to Jesus and say, you know what, I want to come home to the, yeah. to the, to the Father and the prodigal son, uh, we're just so excited that you made that decision. And it's the best decision that you can make. And we want to come along the journey yeah. with you of faith. And we have pastors that are and our prayer teams that are praying for you. But there's a couple things that we want you guys to do. Number one, tell somebody about the decision that you made. Tell somebody that you're saying, I'm in it. I'm coming home. Jesus is the leader and forgiver of my life. And then also we have a resource for you. It's called New Beginnings. You can It tells you what's next in this journey of faith. And it's just a great resource to tell to go on the journey with you. Yeah, and after you've read through that New Beginnings book, uh, we have something around here in person and online called Growth Track. And, and what Growth Track is, it's a four-week class that happens at the start of every month, and that basically helps you. It's a class that we've put together, Pastor Jeremy and a whole bunch of pastors, to, to, to discover the God-given gifts that are in you, and, and, and it helps you grow and helps you understand what, it, what does City First Church believe? Uh, what, what do we believe that uh, the mission's all about? What do we believe uh, for you? What do we believe that God has for you? A way, to, a way for you to get plugged into your church. And so we we encourage you guys to, to go and join uh, Growth Track. It's starting in about two weeks. You don't want to miss it. And if you can't come in person, feel free to go online. It's a, it's, a, it's a great next step for you. It is. And it's for you. It is designed for you. We want to come alongside you in the journey. One other way, if you watch exclusively online and you haven't yet said, I want to be part of the City First Anywhere fam, we encourage you to do that on our website, on our app. Make sure to do that. And also, we have online pastors available. If you need prayer for anything, you can say, hey, I need prayer. There's a forum on our app to be able to yep. do that. But then also, if you need to talk to somebody, there's information on how to get a hold of us as well. Because, again, we are here for you. We want to go with you on the best journey ever. Yeah, and, and one of the best things about this church is that we always have so much going on and everything that you see happens, uh, whether in person or on, is able is able to happen because of your guys' generosity. And one thing that we have around here is called Generosity Rockstar. And basically all that is, is uh, it's you signing up to say, hey, I'm going to give at least $20 a week to say, hey, I believe in the mission. I want to see the mission move forward. And, and it's a great opportunity for you to get invested in and even uh, to grow closer with your relationship with Jesus. Yes, and also we are still in our 21 days of prayer. So make sure you guys jump in. It's not too late. I know that it's kind of, we're into like two weeks already. We have one week left, but it's not too late. You can jump in, you can get a booklet. It's available online and um, jump in the journey to take time out every single day. Let's pray. Let's fast. Even if it's this last week, or if you want to start the journey over, you can, but we encourage you to do it. It's been an amazing time together. And if you're in the Rockford area, join us for in-person in prayer at our Spring Creek location in the main auditorium. It's guided prayer and worship. It's yeah. 45 minutes, an amazing time together on Saturday morning at 8.30 to 9.15. So also, lastly, if this message blessed you, share it with somebody. Yep. Um, watch again. It'll be on demand this week. But we love you guys so much. And we're grateful that you joined us. You are in the right place. And we will see you back here next week. See ya. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've been encouraged today. We say this all the time. We are not just a friendly church, but a family church. And we want you to know we are here for you. If you need prayer for anything, we would love to come alongside you and pray with you. Simply visit our app and tap the Get Connected button. You'll also find resources on how to take your next steps in your faith journey. Here at City First Church, we are passionate about generosity. And when we give, we are able to impact people globally in the name of Jesus bringing practical help and hope. If you were encouraged today, we would love to invite you to partner with us financially to give back to God through City First Church. Giving is simple. Click the link in the description or head on over to the app. We're so grateful for your generosity. Lastly, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again for tuning in here at City First Church. We'll see you next time.